I'm just learning like everybody else. So, um, G event socket I/O is a pretty new topic to me as well. Uh, I've been doing Django for a while now, and uh, in recent days, I've been trying to integrate G event socket I/O with some of our apps for real-time features. So I'll share with you uh, the basic principles behind it, and I'll show you some code, and uh, probably run a simple demo that illustrates how uh, the events are called from client side to the server side. Okay, um, so real-time apps, uh, so everybody understands what real-time means, right? So there's no, uh, in, there's no single HTTP request response cycle. Uh, there's a continual connection to your server such that your server can send message back to your client as well. That's what we mean when we say uh, this is a real-time app. Uh, so obviously, if your server doesn't perform well, uh, your real-time isn't that real-time. So it also depends on your server performance. So a quick overview of uh, what I'm going to be covering. Um, I have a lot of notes on this particular topic. And I'll be, all those notes are publicly available on Read the Docs, uh, completely published in Sphinx. So um, if I'm going too fast or I didn't cover uh, deep into detail on a particular aspect of this topic, you can just jump into my docs. So uh, there's two or three uh, authoritative uh, links on the internet about GEVN and Socket.io. Uh, my docs will also cover what it is all about. And so this is the overview of uh, what I'm going to cover today. Right? Uh, for those who are not familiar, who are only used to building the standard web applications, you might not need to know about concurrency or parallelism. So I'm going to just go through very quickly what that means. Um, for the computer science students, I'm sure you guys know very well what threads are and what processors are. I'm not a computer science student. I'm a chemical engineer by training. So threads and processors are pretty new to me. So uh, essentially, I have to learn that as well. So I'll talk about that. Uh, and I hope that benefits those who are not comp science students. And finally, of course, once you understand threads and processors, you will then uh, realize the signific uh, significance of threads with respect to uh, GVN greenlets. And what greenlets actually are is just a form of a uh, lighter weight thread. Right? I'll go into further detail later. Then, of course, uh, this is the concurrency part of our equation. We are talking about G event socket IO. So, the next part obviously is the interesting part uh, the sockets. Uh, sockets, as everybody who has studied computer science knows, is a fundamental part of your networking uh, tool. It's the, the basic unit which you, use to uh, which you use for one computer to talk to another. Right? Our TCP uh, are all built on that, our HTTP is built on that. So, um, for those who have not played with uh, the standard Python sockets module, I'll also take a quick look at it. And then after that, I'll jump into web sockets and how web sockets is actually related to socket IO. Then, of course, uh, the interesting part is the actual code. And uh, we'll, we'll take a look at how socket IO's on and emit calls are made in the actual example. So, these are some. Uh, topics we're going to talk about. Give me a second. Does anyone have an answer what is concurrency and what is parallelism here? Someone volunteer an answer? Of course, I can just read it from my notes, but anyone? Yes? Um, it's running code on different processors at the same time for parallelism if you have multiple. Yeah, referring to concurrency or parallelism? Um, concurrency. Okay. Parallelism is breaking up uh, something that would be done in serial to be doing them at the same time, either through multitasking or on different. Yeah, you're almost right. So to be more precise, uh, concurrency also deals basically manage a shared state between threads. So between different threads of execution, you want to be able to manage uh, the shared state. And uh, it is problematic because you, would, you could have multiple threads of execution trying to access a part of uh, your memory at the same time. Uh, this is why in Python, uh, the C Python interpreter has something called global interpreter lock that prevents you from doing exactly that. Yeah, so we'll talk about it in a bit more. So concurrency official definition is concerned with managing access to shared state from different threads, while parallelism is about utilizing multiple cores to improve the performance of a computation. Okay, so. Um, in relation to that, there's another term which you'll come across later, which is called coroutine. 
right? Because uh, Greenlet uh, implements something that's called code routine. So it's not covered here, right? But we'll jump on to threads, processes, and Greenlets in a bit. Uh, code routine essentially is a computer program that generalizes subroutines. Subroutines are what we commonly know as a function. So a generalization of functions or subroutines, so-called, uh, essentially is what we call a coroutine co or cooperative functions, right? Functions that cooperate with each other uh, to implement things like iterators, infinite lists, and pipes. So uh, next, we go on to threads. A thread is simply a basic unit of CPU utilization. So we also refer to it as a lightweight process. So all this is going to give us a very good background on what GVAN is going to do next. So uh, compared to a process, right? a process is user, utilizes more resources, and uh, it contains the program code, current activity. It contains the code, data, heap, and stack. Right? Whereas for threads, it doesn't contain the uh, stack at all. Stack use, is being utilized as and when it's needed. So th these are all very basic computer science stuff. So if this is new to you, well, you have learned something, just like I did. Okay, when we launch a Python shell, so okay, this is great as a concept. So how does that uh, help us in Python? When we actually launch a Python shell or when we launch a Python program, right? You like write a web application in Python and you launch it, uh, you are essentially launching a process that is running. In this particular process, there might be one thread or multiple threads running inside. But like I said earlier, because of C Python uh, limitation, at any one point, you only have one thread running anyway. So we call it concurrency because the threads are not really parallel. Uh, they are executing one after each other in a coordinated man manner. And these uh, threads are by default coordinated by the operating system. Now, this has significance later because once we talk about Greenlet, we will realize that Greenlet actually is a coordinated form of a thread. It's a lighter weight form of a thread. It is also a coordinated form. So, Greenlet next. Okay. So, uh, Greenlet is the underlying library which GEvent depends on, and uh, it essentially is a lighter weight version of a thread, and it does not yield its task unless you specifically tell it to, or unless it encounters an I/O operation. Then it will yield by itself. For threads, however, it will yield as and when it likes based on the OS uh, scheduling. So that is the key difference, and it makes a difference in how we write our code, whether we write it as a thread or whether we write it as a greenlet. Uh, the code looks completely different. And finally, an important concept that we have to be aware of is uh, GEvent's monkey patch. Uh, in Ruby land, uh, not to this Ruby, of course, um, it seems to be very popular to be doing monkey patching every, uh, everywhere. It's uh, what all the hip kids are doing these days to the point that all the smart and uh, experienced hackers reach for monkey patch as their first tool of Tool of first resort, even when a simpler uh, traditional solution is available. So, what is monkey patch? Right, monkey patch is the modification of your code at runtime. So, if you define a class, right, a programmer reads the class and expects that class to behave in a certain manner. The problem is that when you implement a monkey patch function somewhere else in your code, in your control logic, for example, and the mon monkey patch applies to that class and add, add some additional behavior. You don't even know about it, and you'll be staring at your class, wondering why your class behaves in a certain way. So it injects additional things, additional behavior, to what would be normally how a class behaves or how a function behaves. So, so GEvent does this very evil thing called monkey patching. So when you use GEvent, you have to be aware that it is actually modifying all the normal things that your Python would be doing. Right? It monkey patches thread, it monkey press, uh, patches processes, and there's a global, uh, call, global function called patch underscore all, global method, uh, which patches everything, and you have to use it when you run your app. So this causes your app to fail in a very ugly manner, right, if you're not careful. Okay, so this is what I talked about just now, concurrency, managing access to shared state from different threads. Parallelism, utilizing multiple calls. Okay, covered this already. 
There's an exception to uh, Python's uh, lack of the ability to do uh, parallel multi-threading. Uh, it is what uh, Wes has actually mentioned briefly yesterday, right? That's Cython. Uh, Cython allows for parallel threads by releasing the uh, GIL. So this is a very interesting exception. And you can check out the source code uh, in Cython. They have this parallel function, which calls a no, no GIL, no GIL function that releases the GIL. And then your, your, your Python code uh, will be running on C and executing in parallel. So this is the exception. Other than that, uh, you can consider that if you're using C Python, uh, you can't have parallel threads. So G event, in relation to all those theory that we have covered just now, right, deals with concurrency. Uh, it makes use of this 2C library called libev and libevent. So does it use libev or does it use libevent? Uh, in G events, 1.0 version onwards, it uses libev, right? And on uh, G event 1.0 below, it uses libevent. Uh, there are some design changes, underlying design changes, why uh, the author of G event decided to switch from lib, uh, libevent to libev. Uh, there's a very detailed blog post that he made uh, talking about that. Right? He just uh, preferred libev having a cleaner code, which is why he switched to libev. On the other hand, the originator of this concept of socket IO, uh, Node.js, actually wraps around something called libuv, right? which is a, a fork, essentially, from libev. But they are based on very similar C libraries. So uh, lightweight threads, as, as I mentioned earlier, called greenlets are cooperative multi-threading. Uh, unfortunately, when you start running your G event processes, you would also look, uh, realize that it is not um, parallel, it is concurrent. It helps you to manage a shared state, but you are not able to run multiple greenlets on different cores. So it is concurrent, but it is not parallel. If you want to have uh, parallel threads of execution, for something like your G event uh, process, you would have to instantiate multiple copies of it. So you're essentially doing multi-processing. Okay. What's so important about libev or libevent is that uh, it's an event handler. Um, in our sample code later, you will see that there's an emit call to send message via socket IO. And uh, on the other end, there will be this on syntax, uh, which receives this emission. So finally, uh, G event spawns a concurrent task, as I mentioned earlier, call greenlets. And uh, the syntax typically that's being used is G event dot spawn. Uh, you can, of course, uh, import the greenlet itself and use greenlet in your code. Uh, but typically, as you see in the sample code later, we'll just spawn it. So a bit more theory about uh, greenlets. It is actually a spin off from stackless Python, it's a separate project altogether. Um, it's uh, the main building block of G event, so we actually have to understand how greenlets work. And it is very different from the traditional POSIX threads or P threads, which Python's normal threading module does, because there's no implicit scheduling. Right? I've repeated myself several times. Uh, normal Python threads does its own uh, yielding. For greenlets, you have to specifically tell it when to yield. Or, Greenlet also used automatically when it encounters an I.O. block. Right? So we specify when the code runs or when it gets switched away. So this is a code example of how you use uh, G event. Uh, there's no mention of the word greenlet here, even though there's another syntax which you can basically from greenlet import greenlet and um, micromanage your greenlet. But essentially, this does the same thing. So imagine that we have uh, three things that we want to do in a particular function. This could be your web uh, view function. It could be just a normal Python function in a particular script. Doesn't matter. Uh, in this particular function, you want to do three things. And these three things are done, uh, does not depend on each other. Okay? They can be executed uh, independently. And their limitation is I.O. Their limitation is not CPU. None of this is a compute-intensive task, which is where Greenlet can actually see, uh, give you performance gain. If you are doing this, and one of your tasks is a CPU-intensive task, 
uh, Greenlet will do more harm than good. So Greenlet's application is in speeding up your I.O. bottlenecks. If you try to use G-Event or if you try to use even Python's standard threading to do CPU-intensive stuff, your performance will drop straight away. So don't ever do that unless we run into that exception of using your threads to do Cython compute tasks. For those, for those contexts, yes, you can still use threading. But in general, threading and G-Event essentially are suitable only for I.O. Uh, like this. An ORM call to your database is an I.O. bottleneck. right? A call to a third-party API, whether you're calling Facebook, whether you're calling GitHub's API, whoever, uh, is also I.O. limited. And of course, when you uh, establish an SMTP connection to your email server to try to send an email, that is also an I.O. limitation. So these are the use cases where you can use GVAN. For CPU-intensive tasks, no thanks. So simple, uh, simple way to do it, gvan.joinall, uh, bracket, jobs. I think I'm missing something here, but jobs, gvan.joinall jobs, and it will essentially, oh, no, there's no need to do so because, uh, yeah, gvan is already uh, calling it. So uh, these three tasks will be executed concurrently. Whichever I.O. blocks, it will switch to the next one automatically and give you back a result in a much faster way than if you were to execute them sequentially without G-Event. Of course, you can make each call uh, without all these wrappers around it. If you don't, uh, it, it, chances are it's going to be slower. OK, what I mentioned about monkey patch, when you run your web application and you put it up on the socket I.O. server to run it, it's, you have to monkey patch it with G-Event. Um, there will be a sample code later. And what is important to note here is that the order matters. If you try to import threading first before you do your monkey patch, you will encounter a very weird error because the thread has been initialized already and the monkey patch tries to do something, uh, try to find the thread ID and it cannot recognize the thread ID. It's a different ID altogether when the monkey patch uh, function executes on it. So the order of this code is very important. If you switch it around, your code will fail immediately, even though it passed unit tests. When you actually run it, it will fail. OK, so that uh, about covers what GVEN does, uh, concurrency and event handling, and the ability to spawn uh, multiple greenlets to do concurrent I.O. tasks. So next, we'll talk about sockets. So this will be a bit boring for computer science students. Uh, sockets are based on uh, BSD socket, right? Um, which is the equivalent of POSIX socket, even though they are different things, but more or less they are the same. So. Let me just flip there. OK, all, all your modern operating systems uh, come with some implementation of socket. So when we write a Python socket, we are essentially wrapping around the basic C socket that we are familiar with for low-level networking. So all our Python socket, when we do import socket, you are doing uh, networking, you're passing message to each other. Now, uh, web sockets and socket I.O. essentially are built on top of that. And uh, we can basically summarize socket I.O. in this manner. Right? So web sockets essentially is a permanent connection, uh, persistent connection, I wouldn't say permanent, persistent connection between uh, one end of a socket to another socket. One socket is in your browser, for example, or any native client that you implement that has a socket. You can essentially establish a persistent connection, whether you're building an iOS app, Android app, or a web app, which uh, is limited by the fact that it's limited by uh, whether the browser supports WebSocket or not. If it does, it will use WebSocket, and you will make a persistent connection to your other endpoint, the other socket. Right? So you can pass message between each other. There are some special characteristics as opposed to your normal HTTP. I'll go into that uh, a little bit. But uh, to summarize it, Socket I.O. is built on top of WebSocket, and Socket I.O. is special because it does uh, graceful degradation. So if your particular browser does not support WebSocket, it will downgrade itself to choose another form of uh, transport mechanism. Right? There are six different transport mechanisms, which you will see later. And in your code, which is where we are really interested in, right? 
Um, there's a concept called a namespace. You'll see how that namespace works later. And your, your front-end uh, JavaScript logic is essentially associated to a particular namespace. In your backend, in your server side, you also have a corresponding namespace. And when you establish a socket, uh, socket IO manages the fact that your JavaScript client talks to your backend uh, code as well in the same namespace. Okay? It actually doesn't matter what language you use in your backend. You could use JavaScript to manage a socket. You could use Golang to manage a socket. You could use uh, Java to manage a socket. In our case, since this is the Python conference, uh, we are using Python to manage the sockets. So uh, in between your JavaScript logic in front and your server-side controllers behind, uh, you would obviously need to make your server-side controllers available by making sure that your socket I.O. server is running, uh, just like you would make your whiskey uh, process running. So the socket I.O. server requires that you pass in your whiskey app to it, and then it will run on a single call, okay? Because it's a single process on a single greenlet. If you want multiple socket I.O. servers, you would have to launch multiple, uh, multiple server, uh, I.O. Socket server yourself. And finally, whichever framework you use, right, whether you're using Django or whether you're using uh, Flask, for example. I have a Flask example, and I have a Django example later. Uh, you would need to specify a URL endpoint which uh, all the socket I.O. messages passes through. Right? All your emit and on functions that are being called here, and all your emit and on functions that are being called here, they will essentially all pass through the router. Okay, so this is sockets for the computer science student. You're expert at it already. For those who are not as good like me, uh, you have to learn, uh, learn what it is. <clears throat> so Python has this uh, standard socket module, and it wraps around the C sockets. And this is an example right, of how we essentially establish a socket between a, s a server and a client. So this has nothing to do with the actual socket I.O. code yet. Uh, this is just underlying what socket does. Right? You can write your own socket to connect between two processes exactly like this. So this would be in a file called server.py, and this will be in a file called client.py. So when you launch this uh, script python server.py, this guy launches, and then after that you launch in another uh, terminal, python client.py, uh, it will talk to the previous process that you have launched. Like that. Some misalignment, but yeah, you get the idea. <clears throat> so more details about WebSockets, right? Uh, it is a full duplex message transfer. Uh, what do I mean by full duplex? Anyone? Both direction. Bo both direction, yeah. If it's half duplex, it means that it's like a walkie-talkie, where you have to press a button, you can transmit. While you're transmitting, the other end can only receive, but cannot transmit to you. That's half duplex. Full duplex means back and forth. Uh, both can talk at the same time, and both messages will go through. That's full duplex, right? Bidirectional. Okay, uh, WebSockets is different from HTTP. It is a completely independent TCP type protocol. The main difference is that it has this thing called upgrade. Uh, there's an upgrade header that's added into your HTTP request. And if your web server is, uh, if your web server supports WebSocket, it will understand what upgrade is, and it will help you to make a persistent connection. So Nginx 1.4 uh, recently just had, uh, just made uh, the upgrade uh, variable available. So in your nginx.conf, uh, you will just put in this variable, and your Nginx will magically work with WebSockets. Right? So this is the significance of this. It's not just for the sake of knowing that right now HTTP 1.1 uh, has an extra upgrade server. No, it actually has a, implementation significance when you set up your nginx.conf or Apache or whatever. I'm not sure if Apache supports WebSockets yet, but I know nginx does because that's what I use. So your server, if it, is a web, if it supports WebSocket, and it can also force the client to upgrade by responding with a 426 upgrade required. But of course, in that case, you would also have the JavaScript logic to instantiate the socket itself. Okay, so this is knowledge. You will see what it means later. And finally, um, 
compared to HT, normal HTTP, you are passing a stream of messages. You're not uh, passing bytes. Okay? A stream of messages are being passed through your, through your socket tunnel. And the end of such a message is marked by something called FIN. Right? You will see FIN at the end of the transmission. Okay, this is the sixth type of transport um, that I'm talking about. So the background is that in the Node.js land, uh, Node.js became very popular because uh, they were the first who came up with the specifications and the implementations of this concept called Socket I.O., which does a graceful degradation. If a web browser supports WebSocket, it will use it. Uh, alternatively, it will look for something called Adobe Flash Socket. Uh, there's a SWF file that comes with it that you will put in your static directory when you deploy your app. Uh, alternatively, if it doesn't have orders, it will downgrade itself and look for a way to do AJAX long polling automatically, multi-part streaming, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it will degrade itself until it finds a suitable transport. So as far as we are concerned, right, when we write our socket IO JavaScript logic and when we write our uh, server-side Python logic to do emit and on, uh, we do not change any code. So the magic of socket IO is that it chooses a transport automatically, uh, irregardless of which transport you're using, okay? based on your available features in your browser. So the most capable transport is selected, no change required in our code. And uh, that's why you don't use web sockets alone, because if you use web sockets alone, which you can, right? HTML5 web sockets, some browsers support it. But if you use web sockets bare bones without using socket IO wrap wrapping around it, uh, if a particular browser does not have WebSocket, essentially you're screwed, right? It won't work. And you will have to write a custom code to deal with a scenario that your WebSocket does not work, right? The magic of Socket.io is that they have already written that for us, so we should be using this. You can almost think of it as an ORM, right? If you write a specific uh, set of code using SQL Alchemy or you're writing something, talking to a database with uh, Django ORM, uh, the beauty of the ORM is that even if you suddenly, I don't know why you would do that, but if you suddenly decide that you're going to switch from Postgres to MySQL or MySQL to Postgres, everything will still work as per normal, most of it anyway. Yeah. Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, there's different implementations of it. Uh, most of these are open source. All of these are open source, and you can find it online. Um, in my notes later, I'll give you the link. Uh, I have detailed exactly where you can find all these libraries. If you so choose not to work with Python, uh, there are all other options which support uh, Socket.io as well. I have a very detailed breakdown of where is where and which version of Socket.io each one supports in my notes. Okay? So fundamentally, when we talk about Socket, Socket.io is built on top of all that. Right, it's a higher level abstraction that solves all this problem for us. Okay, so the code, right? This is what we're interested in. So um, anyone who has uh, loaded up a front end before, whether you're using AngularJS, whether you're using a normal server-side prepared template and serving to the front, you just make sure that uh, your template loads up the socket.io.js script, right? Which I would normally install using NPM. Uh, so I am actually combining uh, the use of virtual end with something called node end, uh, N O D E E N V. Uh, node end is a Python library which allows you to combine your combine your npm environment with your virtual end environment. Right? They will sit in the same uh, virtual end directory. Just that the node, end uh, the node modules, when you install through NPM, will be stored in a different directory. So check out node env. Once you install virtual env and you install uh, node env, you can basically do NPM install. You can do Bower install to install all your JavaScript uh, dependencies. It's uh, great stuff. So we have switched to using, essentially, uh, pip to manage all our Python dependencies and uh, Bower to manage all our JavaScript uh, dependencies. So once you have loaded up that JavaScript, right, however you install it, doesn't matter. Just make sure that when you load it up, you point to the correct directory that's publicly available. Um, if you want to support uh, the flash transport, you need to specify WebSocket SWF location, the additional line above. 
if you don't want to support the flash transport, you don't have to. You just uh, don't load up that particular SWF. Both that file called websocket main.swf as well as socket.io.js uh, comes to you the moment you say something like npm install uh, socket io client. Right? You just say npm install socket io client. It will be uh, placed inside your virtual end. You can either symlink to it or just copy it out and place it in your public directory, which can be served. So the interesting part is this. We instantiate a socket object by declaring io.connect bracket slash chat. Okay, slash chat is what I was referring to just now when I say this is a namespace, right? Just now I say it. Namespace, right? Namespace and JavaScript logic. When we say var socket equals io.connect bracket chat, that is an arbitrary name that I'm giving to the name, uh, uh, giving to my socket IO connection. This name that I'm giving to it is not a URL. You see the slash and chat, and you think, oh, do I need to make sure that I have a URL called slash chat in my URLs.py or in my router in, in my Flask app? Uh, the answer is no, right? This slash chat is only understood by socket IO. It is not understood by your web server. Okay, nothing to do with a web server. This is a socket I.O. specific um, name. It is understood in front in your JavaScript when you instantiate the socket, and it will, be, it will have to be understood by your server-side controllers as well. So you see them being repeated in front and behind. Okay, it's a namespace. Think of it as a controller name, not a URL name. So the second part, uh, of course, soon you will we'll come to the server-side controller. But this is the second part that we wanted to talk about. Uh, OK, first of all, G-Event. Earlier on, I covered the concept of uh, monkey patch. Monkey patch all essentially modifies all your libraries to be able to deal with concurrency. So that, that is what the monkey patch does. Right? If you load in a particular Python dependency, and that Python dependency uh, is a C extension that blocks your screw. Your app will, will basically fail very badly. So when you load in a Python dependency, make sure that it can be monkey patched properly. So, so this, this particular black magic called monkey patch is not a good thing, but uh, essentially we have no choice. So for a while, we have to pretend to be Ruby guys. Yeah, so pot equals 5,000. And then here, you essentially instantiate your socket IO server instance um, by giving it a tuple, which contains your host IP and port. We specify port here. Uh, if you don't specify it, it will just point to 127.0.1. If you're using Nginx as your front end, uh, your front end Nginx server will then have to point to 127.0.0.1.5000. Okay, so if your Nginx config uh, is just a front end uh, with an upgrade support for web sockets, it will have to point to 127.0.0.1.5000. And then you say serve forever, and this uh, socket IO server process, which loads in all your app logic, right? There's this thing called app over there, right? That if you, when we see the actual example, you will see that app will be equals to uh, whatever your Python application is. In Django, it'll be something like WSGI server. Right? You're giving that to this thing called app. And the resource, this one, is actually the URL that we have to ensure is available uh, in our URLs.py. So uh, this is how the router works. Right? This is a Flask example. So on top, um, I have an indentation problem, so it's my slides indentation. This should be just flushed to the front. So the socket.io, blah, blah, uh, this, is, this is what the resource is for. Right? It has to match with this. So if you change the name, uh, you have to change it there too. So it maps to a URL, but what we are really interested in is to use this function that we import from gevent socket.io, called socket.io underscore manage. Uh, all the request variables in the en environment, and then the namespace, right? This we need to specify. 
uh, the namespace being mapped to a backend class, which is called chat namespace. In my next screen, you will see what chat, chat namespace is. OK, this is an example of a chat namespace. I've removed uh, all the detailed functionality in each function, uh, just to give you an overview. Um, you create a chat namespace by inheriting from something called base namespace. OK? You can add in additional functionality, which gives your chat namespace more methods by using uh, the Python mixing uh, technique. And then you specify all your controller logic in here. So each of this controller is named on underscore a particular event, on underscore a particular event. Uh, this, the name of this function is significant. You have to name it on in order for you, when you say emit from your JavaScript, it will talk specifically to the corresponding on underscore whatever event name you're talking about. The corresponding JavaScript for on underscore join will be emit bracket join uh, the particular message that you're pa passing to this function. So this particular function will match with your front end's emit, JavaScript emit. And if you have a, a correspondingly, if you have an emit somewhere here, this emit, when a particular event happens in one of your control, controller and you emit to a particular uh, JavaScript event type, your front end event type will be on bracket the name of the event. So you'll see the actual code later. This is just a summary. So this is your JavaScript, right? We are revisiting the front part again. So this is the slash chat namespace, which we have mapped to this guy, right? Chat, which is from your JavaScript, has matched to the chat namespace, which is your Python class. That's, that's how we are doing matching for this Flask example. Uh, for Django, we actually have a helper function that allows us to, do a to use a decorator to declare the chat namespace. Uh, you will see the Django uh, example later on. This is simply the Flask example. They are a bit different, but the concept is exactly the same. Syntactically a bit different, but uh, the concept is exactly the same. So as you can see here, there's this socket.on announcement, which essentially is waiting on an emission to the announcement from the back end. Okay? It's a bit too small, yeah? She's. Okay, um, my example Django app is here. So if you have internet connection, you can go right there. You can download the code. And uh, I will actually run through the code right now so we can all see what's happening. These are some useful resources that. Uh, you can link to. Uh, in particular, everything that I just talked about uh, is here. Right? Everything I just talked about has been fully documented with uh, painstaking detail. You will see a lot of details inside, things that I haven't even mentioned. They are all stored inside this uh, documentation. So uh, pretty useful if you want to read it. Uh, I have an EPUB version too. So if you want an EPUB version, I can email it to you. Just ping me somewhere, or I put it somewhere for to be downloaded then you can read it offline in your own tablet. OK, so before I end off, let's uh, actually look at some code. Am I overshot with time already? We started later because of the changes. OK, I still have time. OK, so we'll take a look at the code, and we'll actually run our chat app. Uh, my code is my, what I showed you just now was the Flask example. Uh, this particular piece of code here, uh, no. This particular piece of code here, right? This one, the last link here, is my Django example. So this is what we're going to run. I'm going to put this down. Uh, it's a bit too small, so I'm going to just make it bigger. Oh, yeah. But that's like temporary, like, yeah. I'm trying to persist the large font. Is this better? Yeah. OK, cool. So let's take a look. Yeah. 
Okay, uh, so those who are familiar with Django will know that this is a typical Django layout, uh, Django 1.5 onwards layout. Right, this is where my static files get, uh, get collected to. If you're familiar with Django, you'll know what I mean when I say it gets collected to. From here, right? I have a static directory inside my chat application. All my JavaScript logic is contained in this file called chat.js. Right? Uh, this is optional, as I mentioned. Uh, there's something called flash socket. If you don't put this, then your, your socket IO implementation will not support the flash transport. So here's the actual code. And of course, I have to load up this uh, socket.io.js library, which I obtained from NPM. Right? So this is the library I use. This is my custom code. This is, uh, okay. So this is establishing our namespace, right? Slash chat. And correspondingly, on uh, Django, there's a helper called SD, J, J, uh, S Django. Right, which allows us to do some of this uh, much easier. Okay, here I want to show you two different implementations. The first implementation is a typical uh, chat room. Right? You can sign in and you can type something, and whoever else is also in the chat room will see your message. Okay? Uh, and this implementation, which I customized, is what I call a lonely room mix-in, right? instead of the standard rooms mix-in which is a pre-written mixing class available in Socket.io. You can just import it like that. So we'll see two, two examples, right? One is uh, everybody can go into the room and can chat with each other. Uh, this example that I have created for myself is for a very specific purpose. It's called a lonely room chat in because I only want myself to be in the room. And whatever I type, it will go up to the server and comes back to me again. So you would ask me, why would I want to have a lonely room chat? And does that defeat the purpose of uh, having a uh, real-time app? Isn't real-time app supposed to be interactive and I'm supposed to chat with someone or I'm supposed to like someone's post and the other guy will get the like immediately? Uh, well, <clears throat> sometimes uh, you want to be lonely uh, for certain use cases. So the rooms, the rooms use case, everyone is clear. The lonely room use case is uh, what we have to derive for ourselves in one of our projects. Because we want to do a long-running process, which is real-time, which is kind of funny. So we want to make a search, for example. And that search will ping a particular third-party API or will do some uh, long-running process on our own server. Now, we don't know when the computation is going to complete. We don't know when the third-party API is going to return us the results. And some third-party uh, servers are actually very unreliable. So we don't know when it's going to come back. But we want to make sure that when it does come back, we have something waiting for the results and streaming it back to the user and only to the user. I don't want my search results or whatever I ping to go to someone else who happens to be in the same room. right? Hence, lonely room. It's a room only for myself. When I perform a particular task, that task might take some time, but it doesn't matter when the results do come back, whether I'm, uh, for example, using speaker deck to upload my PDF file, right? And uh, that PDF file gets processed, but I see a, what do you call it, progress bar, and when the, the conversion from PDF to PNG is completed, I want a notification to tell me. Right? I don't want to have to reload my page to say, oh, yes, my, uh, my PDF file conversion has completed, or my search results are ready. Right? I don't want to do that. I want the results to stream automatically back to me and only me. Finish? Uh, so, okay, the demo, before I drag on too much. Yeah. Okay, so this is the lonely room implementation. After that, we'll see the, the, the chat room implementation. <clears throat> okay, so I'm in this particular room. Oops. Oops. What? 
Hang on. Okay. Uh oh, something is wrong. Is it because of my lack of connection somewhere? Uh, no, not really. I have everything on my local. Mm. Okay. <laughs> now this is weird. I have everything. No, this uh, I map it to eight thousand for this case. Yeah, and it actually is working because I see this one hundred one being returned to me. This means that uh, when you see a 101 here, it means that, yes, uh, they have recognized that it is an upgrade request and they have established a connection for you. So I do have a connection, but I'm not sure why it's taking so long. Huh? Yeah, let's see. Maybe I didn't load up something. Oh, see, there's four errors here. Ah, I see, I see. Because my jQuery is uh, remote. Sorry. <coughs> That's why it's complaining. I should have put my jQuery on my local as well. Just a sec. Okay. Okay, so this is the lonely room implementation. Um, I'm user A, and I type something. It goes back to the server and comes back to me again. So <clears throat> it only, uh, I, only me will see it, and I can prove it by just opening up a separate browser very quickly. Where's my Firefox? Okay. Of course, uh, Yep, let me open up the other browser. Okay. This guy goes to room one as well, but uh, in this case, I've modified the logic not to care about the room. My room, this is just a pretend URL. It doesn't even matter anymore. I've changed my view logic to use a user session as a room. So when it gets connected, it gets connected to its own session. Okay, so when it tries to talk in this particular room, which actually no longer exists, it's based only on the session, it will only come back to itself. Now, if I quickly switch this to the other branch, this is our traditional chat room. And I give it a go again. Right, user A. And back here. Back in the same room. Notice that the header has changed because I'm using the page uh, to indicate the room name. Just now, the room name was actually a session name. So this is the BV user. When I type something, it will appear on the other screen, as you can see. And when I type something over here, this guy will receive it as well. So it's two separate implementation, one on each branch. You can check out my source code directly in GitHub. Uh, one is a lonely room implementation, and one is a real chat room, each for a different purpose. The lonely room uh, implementation is using the user's session to act as the room name. The URL no longer matters because I modified the logic not to have it matter. So take a look at my GitHub uh, source code and you will see the difference. So these are all the interesting resources that you can use. And uh, I'll put this online and you'll have access to all these links. Yeah, that's it. <laughs>